So, welcome to our, what is the green room, as you can tell by the elliptical over in the corner. This is where my wife does her cardio, and then this is obviously where I've got my home office set up. I had my second dose of the wonderful COVID vaccine yesterday, and that is why I am enjoying a nice refreshing beverage of DayQuil, uh, because it has absolutely wrecked me. Uh, not that bad. I mean, just, you know, achy, tired and everything else. But there's a reasoning for this. And actually, this is good because this brings up some other components of endocrinology that we haven't really touched on yet in this class, but it is a key component of how your body's going to respond in that. Oh, nice. In that what we're going to have is our immune cells are going to release what's known as inflammatory uh, cytokines. So interleukin-6 is one of the big ones that we're going to have a lot from the muscles and otherwise from training. And that's what's going to give us that soreness, that downregulation. So the reason uh, a lot of my body aches right now, the reason I feel nearly perpetually cold is just for the fact of it turns out I've got all of these signaling molecules going through my bloodstream because my body is obviously mounting a massive immune response to the vaccine, which is a good thing because in theory, that means I should have enough of those antibodies so I'm not going to, you know, be able to get COVID-19. Now, obviously that's not perfect, but I thought this was kind of an interesting little thing to bring up, obviously, because it's quite topical for what we're all currently living through this day or these days. And it's something to understand where if you guys do really hard training, we're going to release some of these inflammatory cytokines. And so hence why you're going to find when you're doing really high intensity training or really high volumes, you're more likely to get sick. In fact, for aerobic athletes, a respiratory infection, uh, this could be necessarily bronchitis or pneumonia, but kind of an upper respiratory infection is relatively normal, so to speak, in that population because they're doing in such large volumes of aerobic work at certain points. And it just effectively beats the body down because we only have a finite amount of recovery. So do you guys have any questions there? Prostaglandins are another uh, type of hormone that we haven't really gotten into too much, uh, but it is an important thing to understand that like anything else, your body is finite and it is not a big fan. Uh, in all seriousness, guys, I also worked out for a while yesterday with pretty high intensity after getting my vaccine. So a lot of my coworkers chose not to work out and they are feeling a lot better today um, because I was texting with them and um, yeah. So I'm paying the repercussions of my actions and that's my choice. Um, just so we're clear guys, I'm not drinking that much Dayquil. I watered it down because uh, we only had about one serving left in the bottle. I was like, whatever, I can just sip on it while I'm going. Um, but yeah, acetaminophen is an amazing, amazing uh, drug to utilize to help you get through your wonderful uh, sicknesses as they come. Now, uh, real quick, just because we've got another gold star attendance day, but uh, and I apologize for picking on you guys so frequently just because it happens to be your world. But um, for a lot of our, or not a lot, but we, we've got a couple of folks here that obviously are athletes. Have you guys found that during like preseason, like this could be preseason two days, uh, or this could be obviously going a real hard peak before you hit your taper for a conference, you guys find yourselves getting sick more frequently, getting a little head cold or anything along those lines? Yeah, and that's, it's just the nature of the beast because remember guys, when we talk about cortisol suppresses your immune system a little bit along with, turns out you guys are gonna be doing really, really heavy volumes of work. You've got a lot of energy turnover. You guys might not be able to you know, sleep as much as you want. You might not be able to get as much uh, calories in as you really need to allow your body to fully recover. Um, yeah, fun fact, my resting heart rate was about 15 beats per minute higher last night while I was sleeping. Normally it's in the mid forties. It was uh, right about 60. Uh, so that's, uh, that's not good. And um, yeah, boy, howdy, living that dream. Now, chapter five is all about how we're going to be able to measure the amount of work that we're doing, why we measure it, why it's important and otherwise. Now, one of the first things to realize when it comes to us taking in calories is we're not 100% efficient. Meaning whenever you're breaking down carbs, fats, protein for energy, we're only actually going to be able to use about 40%, could be as low as like 25% of that broken down macronutrient for harness energy for actual work. 60% of it is just released as heat. So 
That's why when we talk about exercise and warming up, well, you're burning calories, which in turn, you've got 60% of that is just wasted as heat. So your body temperature is naturally going to increase. Now, like anything else, this is something we can measure. So there's what's known as a calor excuse me, calorometer, where you're going to be able to put somebody in what's kind of an interesting little, for lack of a better term, cell, where it's going to be able to measure the amount of heat that you're giving off to the environment, along with the amount of oxygen you're consuming and carbon dioxide you're giving off. And if we have all this information, we're going to be able to do a better job of breaking down the total amount of effectively the calories you're using whenever you're doing a certain endeavor. And we actually, well, actually, this is a good question for you guys. And you can put this up in the chat or uh, just go ahead and do the yes or no in the participants. Do you think as a human, you want to be more efficient calorically or less efficient calorically? Okay. There isn't really a right answer here, guys. Okay. So think of it this way. There's pros and cons. What's the pro to being more calorically efficient? Also, guys, calorometers are going to be relatively small rooms that you would obviously be confined in whenever they're going to be doing these measurements. They're usually about the size of like a 10 by 10 room with like an eight foot ceiling and calorometers literally cost over a hundred grand quite frequently to build. Like, yeah, it'd be awesome to have, but it's really, really hard to go and try and get something like that together. So why would we want to be more calorically efficient? What's the advantage there? You don't have to eat as much. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're going to be able to do the same amount of work with not having to burn as many calories without having to break down as many macronutrients. So in theory, you're going to be able to last longer. Absolutely. Now, what on the other side, guys? What about when we have, if we are less efficient? So no, your answer is kind of now we just look at the antithesis where you now you get to eat more or let's be honest, your average American would finally not be so big because you'd be burning more calories doing the same things you were already doing and you would by nature of the beast become smaller. So we wanna be more efficient when we're looking at sporting endeavors, when we're looking at true performance, but if you're just trying to you know, look better in your birthday suit, you probably actually would wanna be less efficient. So now indirect calorimetry is gonna be what we're doing typically. Now, obviously, it goes even more and more indirect measurements, but we're really looking at the amount of oxygen you're taking in and CO2 you're giving off. Now, this is going to obviously give us an idea of how much calories you're turning over, but it's only really useful when we're steady state, meaning we're holding the same work output for longer periods of time. Now, you've got some other ways that we can do things with measuring work on our ergometer and things along those lines, but they take a lot uh, longer. And obviously now we've got a lot of different types of activity trackers and otherwise that give us an idea, but it's not going to be hundred percent accurate. So like I, you know, I wear one on my wrist, which turns out it's trying to track my steps, but whenever I'm lifting weights with the upper body, it's counting the reps typically as another set where or another rep, reps as a step. Whereas whenever I'm doing something like say I was, um, it hurts me to say, but say I was doing a leg press, I could be doing a lot of work or riding a bike, but it's not going to count the steps of the work because once again, it's attached to my wrist and my wrist isn't really moving. So we want to have a good idea of how much oxygen we're taking in and how much carbon dioxide we're giving off. Now, the VO2, that is literally the volume of oxygen we're consuming per minute. And we can figure this out by literally figuring out how much oxygen you're breathing in and then whenever you exhale, how much oxygen is still left in that air? And then we're doing the same thing when it comes to CO2. So we know how much CO2 was in the air when you breathe it in, and then you add to it, obviously, when you're exhaling. So that's going to figure out how much CO2 we effectively are giving off. 
Now, if we have both of these together, we can now look at what's known as the respiratory exchange ratio. And this is going to be that ratio down here, guys, of the carbon dioxide out to the oxygen in. So when we're at an RER of exactly one, we're gonna be taking in 102 for every CO2 we're giving off. And that is gonna be typically where we're metabolizing carbohydrate on average. Whereas a RER of 0.7 is going to be where we're giving off a lot of CO2 for how much oxygen we're taking in, or sorry, we're gonna be giving off very little CO2 for the amount of oxygen we're taking in. And that's where we're going to be metabolizing fat. So it's a lower respiratory exchange ratio. Protein's about 0.85. Anytime we're over one, that means we're having to use a lot more anaerobic metabolism for performance. Now, the advantages or disadvantages of this is that, yes, we need a lot more oxygen coming in to utilize fats as a fuel. So it's kind of a quick little indicator that obviously fats, though they are a great long-term energy source, we're not going to be able to rely on them completely when our exercise intensities really start to increase. And then on the other side, remember guys, this is on average. So when we have an RER of one, that means some of our cells are util utilizing anaerobic glycolysis. On average, most of them are using aerobic glycolysis and some of them are still probably utilizing beta oxidation. So this is still a good indicator of what preferred fuel your body happens to be using. Now, how much CO2 we're producing is not necessarily how much CO2 we're exhaling. Now that's because we're going to be utilizing carbon dioxide or converting it into uh, bicarbonate and then some is going to be bound up to hemoglobin and then some is going to be free floating. So we have some issues with getting rid of it. Now, once we go ahead and get over one, that's where we're having to use more of that anaerobic metabolism. And specifically, we're going to start to see that wonderful accumulation of lactate, which means fatigue's coming. The key is how soon. And gluconeogenesis is going to be where we have that RER of less than 0.7. And that's when we were making new glucose from lactate, pyruvate, glycerol, et cetera, inside of our liver. Now, our metabolic rate is simply going to be the rate our body is utilizing energy. That's it. Okay. So our resting energy expenditure okay, is going to be what we're typically going to be looking at. And we're going to touch on that, obviously, on the next slide with uh, basal metabolic rate and resting metabolic rate. But think of this as just how much oxygen we have to use when we're at rest. Our RIR is usually about 0.8, give or take, meaning we're utilizing more fats than carbohydrates. However, if you just had a meal that was massively carbohydrate, you're going to see you have a higher RIR. And if you had a meal that was high in fat, you're going to have potentially a lower RER. And that notice the volume of oxygen of 0.3 liters per minute. Well, it depends on how big you are. So someone like, uh, oh gosh, the, uh, the mountain um, from Game of Thrones and everything. Gosh, what was the, what's the guy's name? Uh, the strongman competitor where he's 400 something pounds. His oxygen demands are probably higher at rest just because he's a very large human. As opposed to when you look at a very small person, it's going to be much lower. So that Resting metabolic rate for a day, meaning 2000 kcals to just kind of keep yourself alive and, you know, make sure you're maintaining your tissues. That is going to be very, very relative to the size of the individual. So some folks, it's going to be even more than that because they're a very big person. Other folks, it's going to be less than that. Yes, half board, uh, half board Bjorsen. Uh, thank you, Noah. So the basal metabolic rate is going to be how much calories you're using when you're laying down in a thermoneutral environment, meaning the room's not cold, the room's not hot. And this is gonna be after eight hours of sleep and 12 hours of fasting. Now, this is going to give us the idea of effectively what is going to be the bare minimum amount of calories your body is gonna be chewing through each day. Now, obviously exercise is gonna to add to this. The thermic effect of food is gonna to add to this. And so will the non-exercise activity thermogenesis is gonna to add to this. Now, what we're really looking for here is going to be what is going to be the bare minimum amount of calories you need in order to maintain yourself? So notice this is kcals per kilogram of fat-free mass because fat mass is very low caloric demands. And to be honest, muscle doesn't have that high. It's going to be about four or five times higher than fat, but your brain and your uh, liver, your digestive tract, those are going to be chewing through a lot of calories each day. 
And this is going to be influenced by the surface area of your body, how old you are, the stress you're under, your hormonal production, and your natural body temperature. So um, obviously picking on myself, I probably have a greatly increased uh, metabolic rate today because, well, obviously my heart rate was elevated and otherwise because my body is trying to build a whole lot of antibodies. And yeah, I hurt. I hurt. I really don't feel good. But that's okay. That's okay. The good news is I'm not nauseous at least. So I got that going for me. Now, resting metabolic rate is going to be very similar to the basal metabolic rate. It's going to be five to 10%, but it's going to be typically higher. And this is going to be where we're just kind of looking at how many calories are you consuming if you're just laying there? Now, the key is when we're looking at this, guys, we want to try to be in some form of fasting or otherwise, because if we just go ahead and test somebody, the problem can be is if you just had a bunch of caffeine, if you just worked out, if you just had a big meal, all of those are going to go ahead and influence it. Now, our total metabolic activity is going to be not just that resting metabolic rate or basal metabolic rate, but it's more plus the thermic effect of food. It takes energy to digest food, specifically protein is very high thermic effect of food, along with exercise and non-exercise activity thermogenesis is things like tapping your feet, tapping your toes, kind of moving around a little bit. Now, most people, it's going to be from about 1800 to uh, 3000 kcals per day, but you'll see like athletes doing the Tour de France, they can be burning more than 10,000 calories a day. And remember, one pound of fat is 3,500 calories. So they are chewing through massive amounts of calories. Uh, you guys maybe remember a couple of years back whenever it was uh, Michael Phelps talking about all of his caloric demands whenever he was doing his training and that same type of thing. You just hear on a massive, massive caloric demand in order to keep up that amount of work. So as we go up in higher exercise intensity, our metabolic rate is going to go up because we're obviously burning more calories. And what we're going to see is as our exercise intensity goes up, we're going to try to utilize more and more oxygen until effectively we hit a VO2 max, where we literally cannot get in more oxygen if we even wanted to. Now, this is going to obviously start to tap into more of those bigger, more powerful type two fibers that also utilize more anaerobic metabolism. And VO2 drift is going to be where we're going to see a upwards drift, even at lower outputs for oxygen demands. And this is going to be simply where if we sit in a certain intensity for longer periods of time, your body is going to be able to hopefully do a better job of utilizing oxygen and delivering it to our tissues so that we're going to be able to rely more on aerobic uh, contributors, not on anaerobic contributors. So this is where we're going to not yet, but at some point in this class, do what's known as a VO2 max. And this is where literally we're gonna have someone perform all the way up to the maximal ability of oxygen consumption they can do. So, you know, we are looking for uh, subjects for the uh, load carriage study. If you guys are interested, uh, please shoot me an email and I'll forward you on to Yehor and you guys can set it up. But effectively you're going to be doing some treadmill testing where the first test is actually a true Bruce treadmill protocol, maximal VO2 test. So you're gonna, keep walking on this treadmill as the speed and the incline increases until eventually you can't keep it up. So it's not as brutal as the wind gate in that, you know, it's just go for broke and you're going to get chewed up, but it's going to be one that you try to go and hold on and try to increase as long as you can until aerobically you can't maintain it anymore. And then that's the end of it. And this is going to be where we can go a little bit harder as far as intensity, but we're not actually able to take in more oxygen. This is the greatest indicator of someone's aerobic fitness. This is the equivalent of looking at their squat max when we want to figure out what is their squat max. Now, it doesn't necessarily say they're going to be a great aerobic athlete because it's not just your VO2 max. It's going to also be your lactate threshold, which we'll get to in a little bit. And what we're going to see is most people, if we're really trying to maximize VO2 max, unless they were pretty big to start, because your true uh, VO2 max, the volume of oxygen you can take in, is often... is going to be not just the volume of oxygen, but it's also going to be relative to your body mass. So if you're, had a, if you're a bigger person like myself and you wanted to become a better aerobic athlete, just lose weight. You'd be naturally a better aerobic athlete right there. And most folks are going to probably hit their plateau on their, as far as their VO2 max, really within six months to a year and a half of hard training. And anything after that is just learning how to perform at a higher percentage of your VO2 max. So 
when we're looking at that, the VO2 max, it's usually just going to be, like I said, liters per minute. But this is when we're doing things that are non-weight bearing. So this would be things like riding a bike. Now, obviously, when we're running, we have to lift our own body mass. So hence, we want to normalize it for body weight. And this is where we're going to get better data. So um, Abby and Colleen, have you guys done a VO2 max as part of the uh, cross team here? Okay, we had some of the ladies do it uh, last year, meaning like fall of 19 type situation before the sickness came type situation. And yeah, your untrained college age males are typically gonna be between 45 and 50. Females is usually more like 40 to 45. Uh, we definitely had a couple of gals on the cross country team that were over 60. And we had one or two guys that were over 70, which is just freaking awesome. The highest recorded VO2 max that I've ever heard of was 98. And that was from a multi uh, gold medal winner in cross country skiing. Now, typically the reason that women have a lower view of two max mostly comes down to effectively fat-free mass and then hemoglobin. And since women are on a monthly phlebotomy schedule, um, and if you don't know what that means, you can Google it. You typically are gonna see a lower hemoglobin hematocrit in your female athletes. And because of that, they're going to you know, typically have a slightly lower performance, but remember that's on average. There's wide bell curve distributions for both genders. You can obviously be above or below average in any of these given aspects, but obviously when we're looking at aerobic performance, this is going to be the major thing here. Now, remember guys, we're never going to be 100% aerobic or 100% anaerobic whenever it comes to performing any exercise. The key is which energy system are we going to be emphasizing the most out of those four? And what we're going to find is as we increase our exercise intensity, so see the treadmill speed, we're going to hit a point where we hit what's known as the lactate threshold. And this is where we're going to see a rise of like a major point of inflection of rise of lactate accumulation in the blood. Now, this is going to be because what we naturally have is as we increase our exercise intensity, we're going to be increasing our lactate production because we're tapping into more type 2 fibers. Now, everyone also has a certain amount of lactate clearance. So if you think of the lactate production as the faucet on, say, your sink or your tub or anything like that, and then your clearance is going to be the drain. Now, if you, in most tubs, if you were to turn on the, the faucet to full blast, would the water ever really start to accumulate inside of the tub if the drains open? Absolutely. Now we're going to go and we're going to get a fire hose and use that fire hose and slowly turn that up. Do you think that is going to be able to fill the tub? Yes, exactly. So what we're fine, what we're really looking at with that lactate threshold is that's the point where we're starting to, we're using that fire hose and the fire hose is spraying water into the tub faster than it can drain out the bottom. And that's where you're gonna see that accumulation as you keep going up with exercise intensity. And at some point you're gonna fatigue out because it's really uncomfortable. You're, it's gonna be burning. You're gonna have the drop in pH, your performance eventually is gonna go down. Now, once we finish doing that really hard anaerobic work, we're going to have what's known as EPOC. So that is gonna be excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. And what we're actively doing here is because in that initial part of that super high intensity exercise, or perhaps for the entire duration, we're going to be in an oxygen deficit. So a point of which where we literally aren't taking in enough oxygen for the work that we're doing. So once we finish, we're going to have to catch our breath. Now, this is going to be resolved in one, maybe at most three or four minutes, but this is going to still be using a lot more energy, which in turn is going to be helping us a little bit with perhaps uh, body weight modifications or recomposition. So this is something that naturally occurs to probably every single person watching this when you lift heavy weights. As you finish the set and you're gasping for breath for a while afterwards, or if you're doing hill sprints, or you're doing uh, suicides, you're doing long distance sprinting, you just naturally are not able to keep up that oxygen essentially can uh, demand for how much you really need to do. 
So any questions here as to what's going on during that epoch where we're effectively bringing ourselves back to homeostasis with all of the different systems and components that are being utilized with super high intensity exercise? So there's not really a great way to measure anaerobic capacity. That's why we did something like the Wingate. You can also go ahead and there's the critical power test, which is absolutely miserable. Uh, that there is an example online where what you do is you bike up against a, a resistance that's half of the normal Wingate, but you're doing that for three minutes and you're trying to do it at maximal output. So effectively it's a, it's an, it's a brutal, solution to the problem and that what you're doing is you're exhausting your anaerobic uh, energy system. So at the end of those three minutes, you're left with only your aerobic component and whatever wattage or work output you're able to maintain there, that's what you have. Um, I would personally not suggest doing it too much, but if you guys want to try it, go to the rec, get yourself on one of those um, spin bikes, turn the resistance up to pretty much near the top and then just go as hard as you can for three minutes. And whatever your average wattage is for the last 30 seconds, that's gonna be effectively what your, uh, your critical power. So what can you really maintain anaerobically compared to what you can maintain aerobically with those being essentially maxed out? It's miserable. So another big component to keep in mind when we're looking at aerobic performance and really performance in anything is which one's the economy of, of effort. And that is literally how efficient are we at a given endeavor? So. If, notice the example on the right, if runner A and B have exactly, you know, the same VO2 max, which of those athletes is actually going to probably win? If they have the exact same VO2 max, who's probably going to win between runner A and runner B? Notice guys, runner A is using a greater amount of oxygen at the exact same intensities as runner B. So it's actually gonna be runner B because they're more efficient. So notice if, they're, if both of them hit a max at 70, notice runner A can only go a little bit further, but runner B is gonna not hit that max until they're well further along. So that means they're gonna be able to hit, notice guys, a faster running speed. So Aside from having a really high VO2 max, we want to have a really high anaerobic threshold. So we're not going to hit that point where lactate's accumulating until we get to a much higher percent of our max. We're going to find a lot of people are usually like 60% of their uh, VO2 max where lactate accumulation is going to really start. Whereas your really high level aerobic athletes might not hit that until they're well within 90% of their VO2 max. Yes, because runner A is effectively not able to go any faster because they're just not as efficient. So that's where two athletes, athlete B can have a lower VO2 max, but beat them because they're a more efficient runner. Or once again, if the athletes have the exact same VO2 max, the more efficient athlete is gonna be the one who wins. So now mind you, how you're efficient in it is going to come down to a lot of factors. Practice is usually going to be the biggest component. And obviously some exercises are far more efficient than others. And so, you know, running, and this is not meant to be an indictment. I think we've talked about this before in class, but when you see folks jogging around campus that are you know, on the cross country track and field team, they've got really good running technique. Whereas when we compare that to you know, your average person you know, getting into running and otherwise, their running technique's not that good. They're, there's some issues with you know, inefficiencies and because of that, they're having to use more energy to go the same distance. And that's not a bad thing because they're typically running to lose weight. So that's fine. But if your goal is to be the best athlete you can be, you want to be as efficient as possible. And obviously you think about swimming and the amount of energy it's going to take you to swim one mile compared to walk one mile compared to ride a bike for one mile is obviously going to be wildly, wildly different. So any questions on efficiency and movements? So if our goal is to be a super high level aerobic athlete, 
well, we want to have a high VO2 max. And unfortunately, a lot of that comes down to who your parents are. And then obviously training your butt off, having that really high lactate threshold, and then being really efficient and having a huge amount of type one fibers, which naturally lends itself to lower lactate productions anyways, which is going to help your performance. Now, a lot of this, some of it you can obviously train. So lactate threshold is going to be a long-term training effect thanks to the monocarboxylate transporters one and four and how they're going to change with time along with changes in your energy systems and your cells, catheterization, et cetera. You're going to find the economy of effort. That's a motor skill. So that's more practice and practice in a given exercise endeavor. And then unfortunately your type one fibers, yes, you do have a certain amount of plasticity Everyone has a certain baseline, but also has a certain amount of trainability. So if you happen to have a greater trainability there, you're going to typically be able to become a much better athlete. So we have here guys is the calorie per minute demands of a number of different exercises and endeavors. Um, notice, you know, you've got the high demands of running, but wrestling is also pretty high. It's all... It's all very relative and it's not gonna be the best indicator simply because you guys know as well, if not better than I do that, you know, basketball, you can be lazy and obviously burn nowhere near, or you can be doing full court press and be chewing through a lot of calories. And then same thing, swimming <laughs> three miles an hour in the front crawl, like, holy cow, look at that total caloric demand that's higher than the running. But any of you guys that have wrestled before and specifically, up against a you know, very talented opponent, it's really calorically demanding as well. Now, we then need to think about is fatigue. So fatigue is going to be effectively where we're going to have a decline in performance along with you know, perceptions of tiredness and or an inability to maintain a certain power output at a given intensity. So the causes of fatigue are going to depend on the energy systems, the storage of those macronutrients and a number of other components. And obviously it's going to be reversible by rest. Oh, sorry, I just, I'm really achy. Now it's pretty damn complex because obviously it comes in different types due to different types of intensity of exercise. High intensity exercise is gonna be more likely to be fatigue issues with things like ATP PCR, anaerobic glycolysis, just AP, ATP reproduction but not necessarily glycogen levels, whereas more long-term fatigue from doing marathons or otherwise, that's gonna be more of glycogen depletion potentially. It's gonna come down to obviously the different types of fiber, how well, or, sorry, muscle fiber type, along with how well trained you are and then what your diet looks like. Now, the causes, notice guys, potentially are synergistic, meaning they work together. So we have a lack of delivery of energy or metabolism. So we're not breaking it down fast enough for what we need. We have accumulation of those byproducts. And specifically, we're gonna be talking mostly here about lactate and the proton that comes with it. Now, the failure of the muscle contractile mechanism, literally the muscle doesn't work anymore. This could be due to the anaerobic environment. This could be due to electrolyte imbalances. This could be due to a variety of mechanisms. And then literally alterations in the neural control of the muscle itself. So literally the body downregulates your ability to contract your muscles a way to protect you. And unfortunately, this means you're not going to be able to keep up the work output you're trying to do earlier. So the first energy system we're gonna go ahead and talk about here is gonna be that ATP PCR. So the phosphocreatine levels are just gonna be depleted. Now this is gonna be, remember that really, really high intensity exercise. That's only about five seconds, you know, plus or minus, you know, from three to 15 seconds. And it's going to be going down along with our ATP level. So the phosphate accumulation might potentially be a cause, but it's probably more of an issue with just regenerating ATP. So we're going to go ahead and allow ourselves to perform. Now we can try to pace, meaning not go all out until it's 100% necessary, which is a great method for any given exercise in order to make your, allow yourself to last longer. But the big key is, is making sure that our systems and our tissues are able to keep up the outputs we're trying to have them do. Now, we then have glycogen depletion. Now, this is going to be depleted from a lot of anaerobic glycolytic work and a lot of aerobic glycolytic work. And it turns out the longer period of time that you're going to be training without trying to give yourself some carbs and otherwise, the more likely this is the fatigue and you're not getting enough carb between your workouts to allow yourself to fully recover. Now, 
obviously the depletion is going to be related to fatigue because don't think of glycogen levels like a fuel tank. Glycogen itself is a, it's obviously a complex carbohydrate that has a lot of individual branches. And the bigger it is, the more branches it has. Now your body can only enzymatically cut from the end of, of essentially a strand. So if we have a huge number of branches, and a lot of individual strands, we can get a lot of carbohydrates pretty quickly. But as we deplete our glycogen, we've got much, much fewer individual branches. So we're not able to enzymatically break it down as quickly and get as much energy from it as we would like. So this is going to be going down anytime we're using carbs as a fuel source. And obviously the higher the intensity, the more we're turning over, the faster we're gonna go ahead and go down. Now, this is gonna be going down the fastest during the first few minutes of exercise then it tends to decline as we go further through our training. But like anything else, this is something we need to be recovering. And especially if you're doing multiple hard training bouts per day, then you really need to make sure you're staying on top of your carbohydrate intake. Otherwise you're gonna bonk and have a real bad time. Now, what we're going to see Remember with our muscle fiber type with Henneman size principle, we're going to first use our slow twitch and then into our fast twitch fibers. Now, whichever fibers we happen to be utilizing the most, those are the ones that are gonna be depleted first, obviously. And so like anything else, our recruitment is gonna depend on our intensity and how hard we're having our body trained. So if we're doing a lot of aerobic work or type one fibers are going to be depleted. If we're doing a lot of anaerobic sprinting work, our type two fibers are going to be depleted. And either way, our performance is going to suffer. We're going to be slower. We're not going to be able to do as well. And we're going to be tired from it. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is when we're talking about glycogen, we're talking about the individual fibers in the individual muscles that we're using for whatever exercise we're doing. So different activities are going to deplete different fiber types at different rates. So notice, guys, when we're looking at the example from running on flat ground, running uphill and running downhill, you have much greater demands on your gastroc and your VL when you're going uphill as opposed to when you're going downhill or on flat ground, whereas your soleus actually takes and depletes faster on a downhill compared to the uphill, which is going to be just due to the muscle actions and how those two are going to function. Also, there's some fiber type differences that your gastroc is typically a lot more type two and your soleus is typically a lot more type one. Now, obviously what we're gonna find is if we're not able to get all of the carbohydrates from muscle glycogen, we're also gonna be pulling it from our blood glucose. Now, our blood glucose is constantly being restored by our liver glycogen. Now, once our liver glycogen goes down low enough, we're gonna to have to have our liver going through what's known as uh, gluconeogenesis along with the glycogenolysis to put that glucose into the bloodstream. Now, if we keep going further and further and we've depleted our muscle gluco or glycogen, our liver glycogen, and now our blood sugar, we're gonna get ourselves into hypoglycemia. And that's going to cause us to have a decline in performance. You could be a little bit loopy as well and obviously feel like garbage. Now, obviously the rate of which we're gonna be breaking down the glycogen is gonna depend on what type of energy system we're using. So like anything else, an issue we have is glycogen is actually going to be important for utilizing the citric acid cycle. So if we're not able to use the citric acid cycle, we're not going to be able to use beta oxidation as well in your performance, once again, is going to suffer. And as you suspect, when we're not able to use glycogen as a fuel as much, we're gonna to try to use fats more as a fuel, but the problem is we're only typically able to metabolize fats at about two thirds the speed of aerobic carbohydrate metabolism. And obviously going at two thirds of your speed you're going before is typically not going to make you a competitive athlete, not going to allow you to typically be very successful. Now, the metabolic byproducts are also going to be some issues here. So we've got that inorganic phosphate that's going to be now floating around that could be potentially uh, negative. We're going to have a higher amount of heat, which in terms of our body temperature is high enough, obviously we're going to have a decline in performance, like the wonderful fever I had from the wonderful using <laughs> the wonderful addition of the uh, vaccine, which is a good thing, but God, I feel like garbage. Um, you should still be vaccinated the second you guys can. Now, and we're going to have, remember that lactic acid, which immediately is going to dissociate into lactate, which is a fuel source and the proton that comes with it. 
And that proton is what drops your pH. The pH goes low enough, enzymes in your cells don't work. You literally can't even use metabolism. Uh, specifically, glucose metabolism is going to shut down first due to the more acidic environment. And if it goes far enough, remember from what we talked about with the Wingate lab, you're going to vomit because your body thinks you're poisoned. So yes, we can use these energy systems, but understand there's obviously some risk and reward for using each of them. Now, as we're going to go ahead and increase our body temperature, we're actually going to utilize carbohydrates more preferentially as a fuel because we're starting to shift more of our blood flow to our skin in order so that we can sweat and thermoregulate. So we're not able to pull as much from our fatty acids from our adipose. And like anything else, if our temperature gets to be high enough, our muscles literally are not going to work correctly. And now this is a twofold problem whenever you're exercising at a high intensity and it happens to be really hot outside. So when those two are working together, you're going to be in even bigger issues. Now, obviously how quickly we're going to fatigue is going to depend on what's going to be the ambient temperature. So typically most people are going to perform the best for a longer period of time. Now this is going to be with aerobic stock. Cause look at the time in the minutes, we're talking an hour and a half of usually like, you know, effectively mid 50 degrees. Now, as the temperature increases, we're not going to be able to keep up the same output for that long period of time. And the temperature eventually is going to get to us, especially when it happens to be even hotter and hotter. So um, for example, and just because obviously a lot of the stuff is your guys' wheelhouse, uh, cross uh, country ladies, what is the temperature that you guys prefer to actually do your races at? So if you could essentially set the temperature and obviously I'd imagine the humidity wouldn't be too high and you probably wouldn't want it to be raining or really that windy unless it was at your back, yeah. Now, what temperature do you prefer your apartment, uh, dorm room, house to be at though, when you're just hanging out? Yeah, so it's not like you guys are cold blooded and you prefer, uh, well, not, I guess that'd be really hot blooded. You would prefer a really cold environment to be in all times. The key is when they're having to go, you know, pretty much running for, you know, five or more kilometers at their VO2 max effectively, or just shy thereof, they typically are gonna to want to be in a colder environment because it's a lot easier to thermoregulate and it's gonna be a lot more comfortable for the athletes. And so I'm, I hope it hasn't happened, but have you guys ever done a meet where you had a bunch of, you've, you saw people succumbing to heat illness or heat injury in effectively only 70 degree weather, especially if the sun's straight on you for the race. Yeah, which is wild because it's not like it's not seven degrees isn't that warm. It's not like you guys are running out there in snow pants and a full parka. It's, you know, clothing is minimized, but the key is it's just it's a thermoregulation problem. So when you're trying to go with those intensities and trying to keep it up, it can be really, really easy to dig yourself into a hole. So what we're going to find is like anything else, as we're going through really, really high intensity, that wonderful lactate, you notice it's gonna really drop that pH pretty rapidly. And as that pH goes down lower and lower, there, at that point, we're literally not going to be able to literally keep up that workout anymore. Now we've got carnosine and another other components that are gonna work as buffers. They try to keep our pH from dropping too rapidly and too aggressively. But once that pH gets below 6.9, notice the enzymes of glycolysis are literally not going to be working as well and then once we get over or get lower than, or go up to 6.4, we literally can't break down glycogen. So we literally cannot even use anaerobic glycolysis for an energy source or aerobic glycolysis for an energy source. And it's highly unlikely beta oxidation is gonna keep up that work output for what you were trying to do previously. Now, once you finish doing that super high intensity work, then we're gonna see that pH come back slowly with time. And that's also why we like to do active recoveries with athletes after super high intensity because it's going to allow your body to, the lactate remember is a fuel source, it's not a problem, but it's going to allow you to get that pH back up much more quickly because lactate is a preferred fuel source for your heart, your brain, and your type one muscle fibers. So you're gonna be able to get that effectively out of the solution inside of your blood and inside of your uh, cytoplasm. So remember, lactate is not an issue unless we happen to be producing more than we can clear. 
And so if we're just producing as much as we can clear, it's not going to be fatiguing. It's not even going to burn. We're going to be fine. But if we happen to go up too high, that's when we're going to find ourselves into an issue. And yes, once again, it is a aerobic fuel source. It's a three carbon sugar. You actually, there's some folks that utilize this as a supplement. So they put this in with glucose and fructose inside of a uh, workout beverage. So that way they've got a third form of carbohydrate that uses a different type of transporter. So it's gonna be able to go through your GI and get into your bloodstream and then be utilized by your cells as an energy source. Now, another potential cause is gonna literally be issues with neurotransmissions. We're literally, we're not able to get our muscles to contract like they should. Now, this is gonna be due to a number of reasons. We could have a lower amount of acetylcholine synthesis and release. And remember, that is the major neurotransmitter for muscle contraction. Now, we could have issues with breaking down that acetylcholine inside of the synapse. Like we're not able, we break it down far more rapidly or at the same time, it could be accumulating and that's where we're having spasms. But muscle spasms are going, or cramps are gonna be something where it's hard to fully understand what's going on there. Now we could have an increase in stimulus. So we kind of have a hyperpolarization as opposed to the normal baseline. We go even more negative and we're hyperpolarized. So it takes even more acetylcholine, even more greater potentials to get that muscle to contract. And in turn, like anything else, that's going to be built into obviously the resting potential. So as we literally become more and more fatigued, we just can't release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which then it's not going to go ahead and be able to bind and move Tropo, uh, troponin or bind to troponin and move tropomyosin. So the active sites on, or the sites on actin that myosin is going to grab hold of never become open. So we're not able to get those contractions to occur. And the central nervous system itself is probably also a component of fatigue in that what we're going to probably have is a situation where as we happen to do higher and higher intensity work or greater volumes, our nervous system starts to downregulate. You feel tired. You're having a much harder time trying to maintain your work outputs you were doing earlier. You're having a harder time exercising because like anything else, the stress that you're putting on your body is too much for your body to handle. Now, this is gonna be both a subconscious and conscious unwillingness to literally deal with the pain or take more pain and keep going. Now, this is not calling somebody soft. It's more or less, your body doesn't want you to hurt yourself. It really doesn't. So that's why exercising is tiring. It is exhausting and it is going to be uncomfortable. And obviously some people have a set threshold that's higher or lower, but either way, when you're going to true maximal exercise, your body doesn't want you to do that too often. It's like, hey, you should, you should back down. Unless you actually need to run and fight for your life right now, you should just chill. You shouldn't do anything. But that's going to be one of the other contributors that is going to really work. And I'm sure all of you guys have ever gone to the gym or, you know, gone to practice, gone to work out and just been like, I have no enthusiasm of doing this today. Like I have no interest in doing this. I'm not interested. And this is going to be part of that neurological system. Like I said, both the subconscious and the conscious telling you like, Hey, you don't, you shouldn't be doing this. You know, I've, I'm not going to lift weights today. And that's a hard thing for me to say, but that's the smart thing because I feel like garbage and that's not going to be helping anything. But any questions, comments, concerns, as we obviously were able to mosey through all of chapter five, and we are going to obviously be, I believe I just got the, with the message we got for Friday, guys, are we, does that technically mean we're not supposed to be in person for lab on Friday? Am I reading that correctly? Okay, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you guys. So we're just going to go ahead and try to do the lab, you know, online. There's going to be that video of uh, effectively the walkthrough of it. That's, it should be up on uh, the YouTube site that you guys can go and refer to. Um, let's just plan on trying to all meet up for kind of a zoom class on Friday and we'll go through the lab, but let's try to have everybody there for the 125 as opposed to doing the two labs. Cause you guys are just going to, we're all just going to be chatting online anyways. Does that work for all of you guys? Or does some of you guys, the only, only the later lab on Friday works for you? Okay. Um, yes, we should be doing lab four this week uh, since we're currently only in the fourth week of the semester. 
Um, and lab five, that's probably just due to a mistake that I did in Blackboard. So I'll make sure I work on that. So I've gone over today, guys. Thank you guys for being patient with me. Um, and stay safe out there, especially with the wonderful weather we're going through. Don't, uh, don't go slip sliding away. And um, yeah, I will see you guys back on the interwebs on Friday. So stay safe. See you guys then. Bye-bye. You too.